Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and our Masters of the Air series. And our guest today provided expert advice on aircraft, bomb sites, gunnery, and all sorts of aspects of historical detail. We're delighted to bring him to you. I'm going to bring him in now. Good afternoon. Well, it's morning where you are. How are you today, Ty? I'm doing good. Thank you very much. How are you? I'm very well. So we were just talking before going live. I mean, what a job to be part of, whether you, you, you ended up being on that series for two weeks or, or, or the whole production. If you're interested in World War II aircraft and history, what an amazing job. So explain to people who are watching what your day job is and how Hollywood came calling. Uh, my day job is uh, we have a shop next door called uh, Vintage Aircraft, and we fix up old airplanes. Uh, we specialize a lot in Beach 18s and all the military variants of the, the Twin Beach. Um, but we do warbirds and pretty much anything old, old aircraft. So that's what supports us. Um, here next door is, is what we call our museum hangar. We've got a Stockton Field Aviation Museum where we've got a pretty good collection of World War II gear and equipment. Um, we, uh, you know, when I heard about Masters of the Air years and years ago, I, I would send off emails to every email address I could come up with saying, you know, pick me, pick me. Mm. <laughs> um, but nothing came of that. Um, one of the things we do with our museum is called Bomber Camp. So um, we used to use the Collings airplanes, and now we use the Ericsson B-17, and we teach people about bombardier gunnery navigation and, and radio gear and all that kind of stuff on a one-day course. And then we actually load up dummy bombs um, in a B-17, um, and uh, we go fly a mock mission. So people get to try out the ball turret in flight, um, drop bombs with the Norden bomb site, shoot the 50 caliber gun with blanks out of the way. So that bomber camp thing has really been um, pretty popular for oh, over 10 years. And uh, I think it was that that is what brought me in because wow. um, I, uh, Michael Foley sent me an email asking me if I was interested in, in helping out. <laughs> I said, yeah, of course. Um, and then I ended up getting a conference call uh, with some of the production staff um, asking about uh you know, my background. And, and initially they were talking about maybe bringing actors out to us to, you know, to go through bomber camp here. Of course, I explained to them that uh, it's, it's a once a year thing when the bombers are, are near us on tour. Um, so that wasn't going to work out. So they decided or asked me if I could um, to head out to England and teach actors uh, how to look like they can fly a B-17 and do the radio navigation bombing stuff uh, for a two week stint. And uh, I agreed and went out there. And, of course, we had COVID. So there was uh, uh, 10 days of quarantine and all that stuff in the hotel. And then uh, went out and started working with the actors. Um, and that two-week gig um, was – it, it turned out really well. Um, um, I think that they were happy with what was going on. And, um, you know, at the end of the two weeks, I've got my, you know, ticket to go home. And I checked in with production. And production says, oh, didn't they tell you? Uh, you're staying for for the filming. <laughs> wow. I was like, no, 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 nobody mentioned it to me or, or even asked me. <laughs> but uh, I said, let me see what I can do and and uh, rearrange a lot of stuff. And my daughter Sydney and, and my mechanic Ricky took care of things while I was gone. And yeah, it was it's it's like a real dream job to be a World War II nut uh, into this aviation stuff and and to have the equipment and play with it and kind of know how this stuff works. Um, yeah, it, it it couldn't have been a better job. And so um, instead of just working with actors, I always had people coming from every department throughout production, asking questions and getting help. And, and I was helping them with research and showing them uh, how things work and all that stuff. So just doing the actor part was just uh, just a little bit um, of the job. But it was it was, yeah, a, a, a great job, a real dream job for sure. But we'll get into the fact that you helped out with you know, the Norden bomb site and the, the engines and prop set decoration, everything like that. But you know, the, our mutual friend, Dale Dye, who of course took the, the actors for various productions through their boot camp. you know, there's a big difference between training someone to be a kind of a half, half realistic infantryman and the precision technical work done by air crews in B-17s. You know, that's the thing that amazes me, whether you're in B-17s, B-24s wow. or an RAF bomber command, we're talking about people doing high-end scientific jobs, the navigators, the bombardiers. So how, how did you approach taking actors and making them look convincing at, you know, moving rulers across maps and, and, and handling those instruments and looking at the right things? I mean, was it just kind of watch and learn or did, how would the actors approach it? Yeah, it was, you know, a, 
Um, one thing, a, a misconception I had going in, and probably from my daughter and her friends, is that they're always online gaming and playing flight simulator stuff and all sorts of things. And so I just assumed that most kids today, you know, know about aviation and, and have some kind of, so, you know, some kind of idea. Uh, but when we got to working with the actors, um, frankly, not a single one of them had any aviation background. So I had to sit them down in a chair and uh, put their feet out like they're on rudder pedals and hold their hand like they're on a control wheel and teach them the real basics. You know, when you move your hand this way, the ailerons do this and this is how they play in banks. And, you know, it's not like a car where you turn the wheel over and hold it there to continue your turn. If you do that in an airplane, it rolls over upside down, you know, this kind of stuff. So I had to go back to basics and, and started out um, teaching those guys, uh, the pilots. Uh, and then we w went into a cockpit and, and started uh, uh, showing them where the throttles are and the controls and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and, and for the, the other crew, for the bombardiers and the navigators, um, you know, I, I have that kind of equipment. Like, for instance, the navigation stuff. My dad was a navigator in B-29. So, um, you know, I have all of his gear and his nav logs and, and his sheets and his training material and, and his equipment. And we collected a bunch more of that stuff as well. Same with the bombardier. We've got the, you know, a whole bunch of Norden bomb sites and they're actually functional and, and all different versions. And so, you know, we learn about this stuff as a, as a kid building models to, you know, my dad got me a Norden bomb site disassembled in a box from a garage sale when I was probably 15. And uh, so, you know, just been learning about this stuff. Like, you know, you get a thirst for knowledge. You just can't get enough and get into the tech manuals and all that. So um, it was real straightforward to be able to teach um, a lot of the, the basics. What was interesting is doing the research to find the real specifics for the 100th bomb group or what the 8th Air Force was doing in June of 43, you know. Yeah. Um, so that that, uh, uh, that was also a really cool part is to dive in and to do the research for the specific stuff. Like, like uh, you know, this, this early on, the B-17s were taking off in a three-point attitude. So you're getting off the ground just above stall in a fully loaded or overloaded B-17 going off on a mission. Um, that's pretty precarious, but so I would teach the you know the students what it would be like, or the actors what it'd be like to where you hold the control wheel and and power and how the co-pilot interacts and the flight engineer in the back standing between them doing all that kind of stuff. So it was it was really fun to bring these guys together as a crew. Um, yeah, it's highly highly technical. It really is. I mean, um, you're doing a power change. You're looking at a certain spot on the instrument panel, or you're bringing the landing gear up. You know, you're reaching for a certain switch. So um, and the actors were really good. You know, most all of them were, were into this and, and really wanted to learn and uh, did a good job. A uh, bunch of sharp kids. It was just a real pleasure to work with them. So a, a lot of that technical stuff shows, you know, in the final cut. And uh, yeah. and it's, it's it, you can't help but be darn proud to, to see that stuff going on the screen. You're brilliant. So, I mean, you when you're talking there about the actors being inside B-17s, people watching this, there's B-17s and there's B-17s, aren't there? Because it's a representative question we've got from viewers there. Soylent Green is saying, what B-17s were used for the show? Names, I mean. Um, and, and how did... You know, you got, there's, re, there's real B-17s, there's B-17 mock-ups, and then there's all of us. So, so break it down on the different types of environment the actors would be filming within, if you don't mind. Sure. Well, of course, the B-17s are pretty rare. Uh, there's a one in France and the one Sally B that's in England. That's the yeah. only one close by. And sure, there's others in the States that could have been brought over. But if you start looking at the logistics of all of that, uh, reliability of all that, um, it's just, you know, it's not hard to figure out right off the bat that that's just not going to work. So they didn't have any real B-17s to use for the production. Um, they contracted with a company called BGI in England who actually made two full-scale B-17s, steel structure on the inside, aluminum on the outside, and they're stunning. I mean, you walk up to the thing and, and you really can't tell that it's not a, a B-17. Um, but it's, it, so they built those things. Um, and then in the studios, they actually had, uh, yeah, like what you see on the screen here, that's one of the, the full-size B-17s, but they also made a fuselage. So they had uh, a bunch of different fuselage, one for the special effects guys to blow holes into, uh, the hero one, which has all the, the most detail inside from nose to tail. Um, and they all were set up, they were fiberglass made uh, and set up with access panels to open up on the side to get cameras in. And uh, they were pretty amazing. Um, what we also had was what you're seeing right now, good cut, is uh, a Dave Littleton. Um, he's a B-17 enthusiast, been around forever. And he built this mock-up, this cockpit, in his garage over the last 20 plus years. And, and there's a ton of real parts in it. And all the switches are correct. I mean, it's all like real. 
So that's what we use to train the actors um, when we moved them out of the folding chair into the cockpit so they could get used to all of this stuff. And it really was amazing. And thankfully, we were able to use that for a lot of the close-up shots. So if you see somebody reaching for the landing gear switch or turning the boost pumps on or the fuel shutoff valves or or throttles and all that stuff, it's usually um, shots inside of Dave's cockpit, which was just wonderful to have. Um, and he built this thing with his hands all from scratch, which is just yeah. incredible. So that was very nice to have. And then um, they had a whole nose section, which is basically from the bomb, uh, bomb bay all the way up to the, the tip of the nose in a big gimbal in what's called a volume. It's like a, a big video wall. It, it almost surrounds the thing and, and it's overhead in the ceiling and, and it's on uh, full motion. So it can pitch and roll and do everything you can think of. And uh, um, that was great. So the actors in there could you know be looking outside instead of looking at some green screen. Uh, there's the flak and there's, there's the fighters coming in. So we have, they have things to look at. And one of the more important things for, you know, for me was that, where is this guy flying in formation and where is he looking in flying formation? You have the lead airplane, which is basically looking ahead and following the course, but every other airplane in that whole uh, formation is looking at the plane next to them. So figuring out exactly you know, the, the pilot where he was in the formation, you know, to be historically accurate, that would tell where he would be looking you know, left or right and, uh, you know, flying the aircraft information. So, um, and then same with the guys, the bombardiers and the navigators, you know, uh, he's going to get out and look for, for the target or something. Okay. It's going to be off to the right. So he'd get up out of the seat and look out there. So, you know, a lot of this stuff was, um, you know, the, the painstakingly researched so, so that it was accurate. So when the guy would get up to, to do something or when they were looking out the window, they, they were actually looking in the right direction. And that's a good point to bring up the elephant in the room that is the the rivet counters that have been out. I was going to say in large numbers, but I don't think it is large numbers. They're just very vocal. I think the majority of us, myself included, have just taken on board this series and accepted that it's an entertainment. It's a drama. And we, you know, I've just gone into it embracing the, the and, and being grateful for the fact that this production has been brought to me. And sure. There's everybody who knows a little bit about World War II will see the odd thing. They go, well, that perhaps doesn't look like, like those belts of ammunition don't seem to be moving the right way. But the, the, the idea I got from you and I got from Don Bill and I'll get from John Orloff to Mary is that there are literally hundreds of people working on this, trying to create the most historical, historically accurate series possible. But of course, there are going to be little things that slip through. So how is a, is a, is a big, huge question. But how do you balance practicality and authenticity? At what point do you you go, okay, they're not going to see this? I know, I know you're one 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 of many people involved in this, but was there kind of an overriding kind of um, message sent out from the production about how you're going to balance that? You know, the thing I, I noticed from from the very beginning was the, the uh, overwhelming rule seemed to be accuracy and authenticity, and and people went a above and beyond to to uh, to make it authentic and to make it realistic and um, um, and, and, and there wasn't hundreds I've heard uh, somewhere between 1100 to 1500 people on set per day working on this thing and from every different department you can imagine and every department I worked with really wanted to make things accurate and so you know, that's why a lot of them were coming to me to ask about certain things, whether it was uh, the lighting guys who were in charge of the instrumentation. They actually had made special instruments with the, the needles to move. And, and then um, and initially they had lighting from behind and, and it was flood lighting. So we you know, fixed that kind of stuff and, and made all these little details, you know, more and more authentic as we went. But yeah, but yeah, it's a problem because you can only do so much and, um, and to, to make this accurate, because the, the, the main rule is you don't want to slow down production. So I can't imagine what it costs per minute, uh, per second, per hour, day to, to put on a production like this, but that's not something you can slow down very much. Um, and so you have to keep it rolling. And so we were able to, to help with details and fix things and, and, and work out that stuff, hopefully as much in advance as possible, um, to, to make it more authentic. And and we did, and it, it it really worked out well. But yeah, you got all these people running around doing stuff like crazy, and, and sometimes things would fall through the cracks. Uh, you talk about the rivet counters, yeah, talking about um, you know certain you know certain aspects that doesn't seem authentic or correct. Um, but yeah, there were some mistakes, and some th things would slip through the cracks. I, I noticed, um, like you have uh, the 
um, you know, the production or the, you know, the art department wants to set up a certain thing and they, and they prepared, um, let's say the 50 caliber shells was one example we had uh, one day. They made tons of shells. In fact, they made replica shells made out of rubber and the links made out of rubber. I mean, you couldn't really tell the difference, but the idea is you, uh, an actor could step on those and it wouldn't be like a roller bearing where you'd, you know, slip out from underneath it. So they made tons of this stuff. And then um, when it comes down to actual filming, you know, I'm looking at the camera saying, yeah, well, we don't, we don't see the, all the 50 cal shells. This is a big running battle. There should be, you know, there's 10 to 12 links and shells coming out of every gun per second. So imagine how much stuff is going to be on the floor. And, uh, yeah, they, they said, well, you know, I just put some in there. I said, well, we can't see them. And I had to pull out pictures showing, um, you know, where the guys were up to their ankles sometimes in these yeah. shells. In the F model airplane, they didn't have a way to catch these shells. So they are all over the floor everywhere you can think of. And so we brought in buckets and buckets more of that stuff. And and that's one of the details. Of it. It, it looks great. Production and the people had made all that stuff ready. But when it comes down to filming, it's like, hey, where is that stuff? Sometimes there are these little gaps in between. And and, and thankfully, I was able to, to help out with that and, and uh, you know, put some of that stuff in. We had an engine engine change or engine on a stand sequence. And when I walked up, uh, it was on this rickety old uh, little engine stand. Looks like it was made in someone's garage. But they had made these A2 hoists, these beautiful pieces of equipment. Uh, we have one here at the museum. I think it's one of the only ones around. And they reproduce these, and they're stunning. And so it's like, well, what happened to the hoist that you guys have? And they said, well, well, they're across the field. I said, well, we got to get them over here. I mean, you guys made that. This is the perfect scene for it. So that kind of stuff was, was really fun to be able to do. But, yeah, there's guys just, you know, uh, saying, oh, you know, this is wrong or that's wrong or whatever. But, yeah, you know, again, look at the big picture. And that's what I used to tell people. It says, for every one thing you want to complain about, you tell me five or ten things that are amazing that you've not seen in any other production, in any, any other yeah. film since World War II about the 8th Air Force, because the details are in there and they're just incredible. Well, that's, that's, I think, the message. John, when Don Miller was with us yesterday, he was saying that he's received literally dozens of emails, people, family members of people he'd been corresponding with for years, and he knew Rosie and, and, and Clevin and all these guys, and how, for the first time, these family members are, are, are really understanding what their dads, their grandfathers, their uncles went through. Because as good as the old movies were, as good as 12 O'Clock High and... Uh, the War Lover and Catch-22 and the other classic aviation movies, what you did with Masters of the Air in filling that sky with aircraft hurtling towards each other at high speed and all the flak and stuff, it is the most visually stimulating. I mean, I found myself swearing, and I swear a lot because I'm an Englishman, during it, just go, fuck, just to see what you're seeing on screen. And did you, did you sense when you were there on the set that you were creating something special then? I mean, obviously there's a huge amount of money going into it, but did you feel it was, it was, it was good when you were doing it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think everybody did. And you go back to the history, the band of brothers stuff. I mean, in, in the Pacific, um, even Greyhound, it's just like incredible. And, and the detail and authenticity that they put in the, to those shows, I think everybody felt it, even though um, you couldn't see it, right? I mean, a lot of times you, you're impressed with the, the set and everything going on around it. But then we never saw like a lot of the, the you know, the final effects, of course, and, until yeah. um, we saw the, the final ep episodes. And, and that was dang impressive. Um, so, yeah, we, we knew that it was an incredible thing. And that's why everybody was so... Uh, working so hard to make this as as authentic and 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 as correct as possible um but yeah er everybody i think knew and that's why they were really busting their butts and knew that this was something mm. special and something's going to live on like band of brothers which yeah. is what tw over 20 years old and look at how well that's doing if this show gives people especially yeah the family members um an idea of what these folks went through because you know uh, your, your grandpa can only tell you so many stories but we're pretty visually based, uh, you know, nowadays. But to see this stuff come to life on the screen is incredible. Uh, and, and I saw a lot of that stuff. You know, there's things I'd read about, um, like in the B-17F, uh, where the gunners were right across from each other, the waste yeah. windows were right, right across from each other, and, and and they would bump into each other. And I read about that and kind of understood it, but had no idea until we actually set up this scene um, with the gunners and how hard that was for these guys to do their dance around each other. Uh, and and with all the equipment, you know, bringing all that stuff to life that you don't see in 12 o'clock height. That's a great picture. Look at all, yeah. 
you have oxygen hose, your heated suit, your mic, your, your headset cords, all going up to the same place above you. And how easy is all that stuff to pull out? And, and it happened a lot. You know, I swear those guys must have had friction tape or something to tape their connections together yeah. so they wouldn't get pulled out so easily. But look at how they're, you know, they're crossing over. And then, of course, later on, they staggered the waste windows to try and get away from this problem. But look at all the gear in there, too, and, and the extra ammo boxes. And, and that's a great shot showing, yeah. you know, all the detail that went into this. Well, stuff. I'm the, glad you, know, you mentioned that because... When I heard about Masters of the Air years ago, like everybody else did, and you're thinking, so what, what story are they going to try and tell here? Because there's the kind of the, the overarching strategic bombing story of, of what is going to work, precision area, the British method, the American method. And there's that story that is worth telling, which the series doesn't really try and tackle. But what it does tackle, often I feel quite subconsciously, is the, is the development of just, as you said there, techniques within the aircraft the b17e fg models each having those little improvements and you know you see it with harry crosby and the working out of the the flight paths how there's always improvement being shown because the whole story of, of strategic bombing is is a gradual improvement it wasn't working very well at the beginning and by the end it was working pretty well and yeah there are bumps along the way but i think trying to convey some of those improvements um was, was was a real asset of the show even if some of the viewers wouldn't have necessarily seen them but anything else you talk about the the, the positions of the waste gunners there but anything else you were trying to kind of get across about that learning curve of what it was to be a b-17 crewman yeah it, it, like you know they started out with a b-17e the e model up in the nose had a 30 caliber gun and multiple gun sockets and you would take it out of one socket to put it over here so it's just it just wouldn't work and and then so in, in the F in, in the, the series you see that where they put the fifty you know up above the um, above the bombardier uh, sticking out of the nose so that um, you know uh, he had some kind of defensive firepower because those frontal attacks were just devastating the fleet taking out the pilots and the bombardiers and navigators like crazy and and then so eventually they came up with a whole powered turret up there for him as well yeah. Um, but yeah it's this whole entire um, uh, bombing campaign was so new and, and completely untried and, 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 and bombing from altitude, you know, uh, the Norton bombsite has got a revisionist historians bad rap recently for, um, you know, being, Oh, too expensive and not worthwhile. But, you know, what do we have going into the war? These, these, uh, you know, basically stuff, bomb sites left over from world war one, you know, where you're, you know, have a, some wires outside and you're dropping the, dropping the you know a bomb by hand out of the open cockpit now we're flying at 200 300 miles an hour at 20 30,000 feet you know you need you can't just put your foot up on the glass and you know pickle a, a bomb to try and hit things so there you know these revisionist historians saying that the norden bomb site was not very good but yet what was it that brought germany you know the, the war industry to their knees you know it was the british flying and and, and the u.s trying to take out uh you know, the the ball bearing plants and munitions and the fuel and and the sub pens that were slowing down the product you know all the stuff coming from the states it's just incredible and that uh um you know it, that stuff did work and it was a huge yeah. learning curve uh and there was uh, sadly a lot of this learning curve was was written by blood um yeah. so many people died to learn about this stuff um all throughout and yeah that's what's uh that it, it also shows in the in the series too where you know these improvements you know do show up as we go no, on definitely. and and as you mentioned northern bomb sites and for those who haven't seen it there's a fantastic behind the scenes facebook group on, on, on about masters of the air where you've put some of these photos i'm sharing are ones that you've put there so when people watch the series they see a northern bomb site on screen at various times but this is a really good example for you to explain to us there are different types of northern bomb site you're seeing from the hero one to the rubber models and things for different use so it's it, you know we can serve as a good example of what you're doing on that entire production in that you know there's the you know with the other shows there's prop helmets that are made of rubber so that it, so they don't you know if you if your stuntman falls over they don't hurt themselves so explain the different types of northern bomb site you are working with on this on the set yeah, so this is this is a good example. This picture shows it's a real Norden bombsite head, and, and I'm, you know, I'm a bombsite geek. You know, we've got one back here, Norden, that has like all of the bells and whistles, pretty much the the ultimate version of it. But early on, it was a bit more basic, and and so 
um, the, the, the site head that you're showing here was actually a period correct, exactly right for June of 43 bomb site, uh, basically an M9 series bomb site. But below it is the stabilizer, part of the autopilot that it's mounted to. And, and you can kind of tell that it's, it was, um, it was shot made. And, and so, you know, being a bomb site geek, I'm like, you know, Hey, there's gotta be something better than this. Cause a lot of these shots are going to show this stuff. And, and, uh, Long story short, they found an original stabilizer, and I had uh, my daughter send some parts back off of this very bomb site, um, the automatic bombing computer and directional panels and some other uh, details that, that they used um, that I thought w would be handy. So, um, yeah, we put all that stuff together, and, and it, the bomb site went from, yeah, actually, there, there's the shot of, of uh, the site with all real components. Um, uh, so... Yeah, that great little detail. And then working with the bombardiers on how to use the bomb site. The Norton is, you know, it's not the most, uh, uh, you know, friendliest thing to use when you're really heavy into it. Your head's in the eyepiece and then your two hands are kind of come underneath to to, to adjust things um, to synchronize the crosshairs on the target. So teaching the bombardiers the basics and using, yeah, he was a really good student too, uh, using the... Uh, um, the caging knob to uncage it, to look like you're leveling it, just going through that, a lot of the basic procedures. And a lot of that stuff came through. And then some of it, you know, um, got messed up again in, in production stuff or if I wasn't around or it was filmed somewhere else. But uh, um, but the guys did a great job. And we, you know, again, didn't want to slow down production. So um, the, these, these guys really put in the effort and learned well. And I, I was able to be there on the microphone and, and talk to them. And, and a lot of times some of the... Um, the directors would change things on the fly. And so when they did that, then we had to change a little procedure, change a camera angle, and then uh, something else would be seen. So we'd, you know, we'd always kind of be changing things and fixing stuff. It happened a lot, especially in the first four episodes with, with Kerry. He had a real artistic guy and, and would, you know, see something that he'd like to change. And, uh, um, and, and so we'd, you know, have to have to change things real quick, but it was, it was kind of fun. Um, yeah. yeah. And, it, and it definitely looked like, that most of the people in the background, 90% looked like they were doing what they were meant to be doing. So when, you know, when the briefing room was in the briefing huts, there would be, because we've all, I, I'm thinking of kind of the old Star Trek episodes where clearly extras are bored over there and they just do a lot of clipboard acts. They just kind of walk around in the background with a clipboard or kind of pointing vaguely at lights and things. And you can, these days, you can kind of spot that a mile off. But it seems to me that everybody in the background, the people working on the, the ambulances and the, the crew, the aircraft, the, the vehicles, they all looked like they were doing something that, that was, you know, inherently historically based. And of course that all comes down to putting people into an environment that is historically accurate. And, the, and that was something else you were involved in just the setting up of those, of those um, environments. And did, did the, your experience with the actors, did they appreciate being in an authentic environment? Because it helps them get into character, I'm assuming. Yeah, it did. In fact, a lot of the guys, a lot of the actors uh, were World War II aviation enthusiasts as well. Uh, this one guy um, who ended up playing a crew chief um, uh, on, on on one of the aircraft, uh, he's just an absolute nut and collects this kind of stuff. And he's also a metal detector uh, guy. So um, the show was, was filmed basically nine to five, Monday through Friday. And on weekends, uh, he and I went off to Thorpe Abbotts and, and some other places and, and did some metal detecting. And, and frankly, we found some amazing stuff, like right, right around Rosie's heart stand. Um, wow. We found some B-17 parts and various other things like, uh, you know, and he was amazing that he could tell by the sound of the metal detector um, that, hey, there's a 50 cal round down there. And sure enough, six inches underground, there's a 50 cal round dated 1943 that you know darn well probably flew over Europe on one of these missions. So, um, yeah, that, that was neat. So a lot of these guys are super into it. Um, the graphics department, this is a good example shown here. If you walk around the set, you know, sure, there's some stuff on top here. But if you dig down underneath, every single piece of paper, or piece of paper in those stacks is all authentic and period and incredible. I mean, the, the charts here, too, like there's a flak map showing, showing uh, the, the flak emplacements early on. When they were flying, they were right on the coast. And of course, this changed as, as time went on. As uh, the, the Germans got pushed back, that, you know, the flak started to disappear on the coast and created a new line. So um, I was able to go to the National Archives there in, in England, an amazing thing, able to find files, uh, the, the mission files that have all original 
uh, documentation in them, just, you know, sort of like what's pictured here, but original photos with the Air Ministry watermarks on the back of the paper. Uh, great stuff. And remember, this is during COVID. So, you know, the National Archives in the States were all closed down and they had multi-generation copies, really poor copies of a lot of the information. And then when the National Archives in England opened up, I was going in there on weekends um, finding the original, there's the printout right out of the, the teletype, you know, for the mission order, and then everything that went with it. And then how the British went off and and, uh, and did the photo reconnaissance, like right after the mission, and then a day later, a couple days later. I mean, that kind of stuff is incredible, too. But it, it, that was an, an eye-opener for me, looking into the massive amount of effort not only does it take to put this on, but to, to do the follow-up as well. And one thing I really love about Masters is how they show the ground crew. And they show yeah. the guys like you're talking about, everybody in the background riding on bikes and, and everybody's, you know, this is a city basically. And everybody has a job to do and everybody's going around like crazy doing that job. And they show that and you get to, to, to meet uh, Lemons, the crew chief, and, do, and see some of the incredible things that he did. That was just like, you know, a normal everyday thing for him. But, you know, when we're looking back on it, it's like, oh, my gosh, this guy actually rode in the gear well of a B-17 to fix the the points on a magneto as he taxied out and then right before takeoff then he he uh um gives you you know they clear they start the engine they do an engine run up it kind of missed some of that part in the, in the, the show um but he actually did a run up power check everything's good and then pff, off they went you know it's just incredible stuff and that, that's and then, it's worth mentioning that because you explained on the facebook group about how much more was filmed of that sequence with lemons there played by rafferty law jude law's son and when when you someone like yourself and you've gone to all that effort of getting the, the the equipment right there's the magneto you've explained the actor so you're going to be doing this you're going to be turning this you're going to be putting that there you're doing this you're setting it all up and then when you see that 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 scene has been cut down a little bit on screen obviously you understand why that's been done because every second on screen counts every every second is part of the narrative part of the story but is it a little bit frustrating when you've spent a lot of time setting and filming a sequence to see it reduced? Um, yeah, sometimes, but I mean, the, the final, uh, the final scene looks really good. So yeah. I understand, you know, originally it was a 10 episode show. Uh, this could have been a 30 episode show. There's so many stories to tell. And uh, because of COVID hits, we had two big COVID hits and then to shut down production for two 10 day stints. You know, 10 days, all that 1,100 to 1,500 people per day are still getting paid, but no production is happening. So, yeah, they ended up cutting it back to nine episodes. Um, but, yeah, you know, um, it, it, it is incredible. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I did a little brain fade. Uh, tell me what, what your question was again. Uh, it was just on. about you know, the, the frustration of, of, oh, of, yeah. of the effort that you've put in and not just yourself, all these other people that then is reduced to just a few seconds on screen. Yeah, there, there's a, a lot of that. There's so many really cool scenes that were filmed and I hope that stuff comes out eventually down the road. Um, yeah, a lot of effort went into some huge, huge scenes that, um, yeah, that were cut out. Uh, the lemon scene, I, I don't know. I thought it portrayed it fairly well. Um, I even got some comments from some uh, Warbird friends that, you know, hey, using the feeler gauges, wow, I totally didn't expect that, you know, good little detail stuff. But those little details were what people like Stuart here in, in this picture was bringing in. Stuart, an amazing guy, one of the hardest working guys on set, and, uh, and, and he is an absolute World War II nut. And he's bringing so much to the set and making it happen and, and filling the gap of some of those details I was talking uh, to you before about where mm. little gaps and he would he would just bust in his butt trying to, to make it work. So it was people like him, but there's thousands of them um, that just really working hard to, to get all those details in. And sure, a lot of scenes got cut. Um, hopefully we'll see him someday because there, there's some really good scenes that, that didn't make it. And it was, it's fascinating seeing in all the photos just that the COVID is definitely there. Yeah, everyone's wearing masks. You've got your distances. It means people are suddenly not on set to suppose to be on set and quarantine. And you know, because we're out of that era now, we've kind of forgotten what it was like back then. And it, it was it, it, it must have added a whole level of, of extra stress and complication to the production. And, and it's even more of a testament to how brilliant the end result is that, that with all those problems, it did end up being as good as it was and um but to, to kind of move on to some other, other things about that balancing of of accuracy and authenticity and storytelling um there any other moments from your work on it that that you feel were, were really important and you were glad you were there specifically for that part of it 
Uh, yeah, I, I think um, mostly probably the, the the pilots and and what they were doing. Like I think it was in episode two where the the Greenland landing. Um, uh, that that kind of combines several of the things we've been talking about. So in the script, it was just horrendous crosswind, which is kind of unrealistic. If it was that bad, then yeah, I probably wouldn't be landing at all. Not that you have a choice coming, you know, from the states, but um, the the crosswinds were really bad. So we we got the crosswinds kind of modified to something that's still really really challenging, but a little more realistic. But then how you know you're going to fly this B-17? You're coming in at a crab angle, you know. Uh, basically looking out, and the pilot would be looking out the co-pilot's glass uh, at, at the runway as you come into this crab angle. And then a second, you need to kick it out and plant your upwind wheel. And so, um, you know, I was going through all, all that stuff with Austin and and also making it like, uh, you know, Austin, you kick ass at, at flying this aircraft. So this is not something that's going to be scary to you. It's like, you got this and that's exactly what he portrayed and he's he's cool and he's coming in and he's doing his job and and everybody's uh, doing their thing and uh and so like one of the things uh, you know there's differential power which was supposed to be used on the runway only when when your wheels are on the ground and the wind is hitting a gust but they use that in flight but it, it looks really good you know like they show him using differential power in the throttles and then show the engines kind of zoom in and so you know most people won't won't know or care but that was a little thing i like Dang it, that was supposed to be for the ground. But you know, that's post-production stuff and 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 it looks really good. So I'm I'm really happy. Uh, but yeah, there's you know, this this is a good shot uh, showing um what was a combination belly land and a ditching scene on the same aircraft. Um and the ditching scene um uh, pretty much got cut out. And it was great because all the guys were coming out um of the radio room and the pilot co-pilot right here coming out, grabbing onto the gun barrels to kind of crawl back the fuselage. Uh, you just see uh, by engine number two behind the prop blade is the raft. Um, you know, they they tried. They had a company in Belgium reproducing the raft. One guy had loaned his original World War II raft, and they couldn't reproduce it. So um, they used an original World War II raft that came out of that compartment on the wing, and uh, and these guys are getting it all set up. And sadly, that was a really good, that whole ditching sequence scene was really good, and um, and it was cut out of the film. Hopefully, we'll be able to see it someday. Well, indeed. And and it, I'm glad you reminded everybody that it isn't just everything done in a computer, because I think a lot of people these days think that visual effects, it is just, you know, kind of geeks with, with incredible software doing all this stuff. But you were doing a lot of stuff on set as well. There were, you know, you had the fuselages, you had the hulls there, you had this equipment, the vehicles are correct. So, you know, the, the, the landings, things like that. So how how are you able to visual, how do they brief you on what they can do later with the computers or are you getting kind of rough animations at the time as you know on uh, on set how does it kind of work when you're told okay we're filming a sequence where b17 comes in to do a belly landing yeah steven rosenbaum the head of vfx just a, an amazing guy and he, he was a really good friend he helped me out a lot huh, on this stuff and uh um and explaining a lot of the the movie industry and how things work <laughs> one of the things i liked a lot um uh, he says that everybody is very protective of their lane in the pool yeah. And uh, and here I am, you know, I'm doing cannonballs in the deep end, not knowing any better, just trying to get things done. And, and he was just a great help. But it, it, he would be there and they they have uh, previs and even storyboards, going back to storyboards. But a lot of the stuff they had on the screens kind of set up uh, in lower resolution uh, form to sh show you what was going on on a lot of this stuff. And um, and and then, of course, in the script, in, in John Orloff's script, uh having the descriptions of things and then they'd turn into storyboards and then previs and, and, uh, and, and then we start shooting it. And uh, so, yeah, you had a pretty good idea of what was coming. And um, then they were also trying to figure out the various camera angles too. Um, as you can see here in this shot, he shows uh, all the different cameras that were, would be filming just on one scene um, in all different, you know, different angles. So uh, what's, what's, where are they going to, you know, what's going to be seen? What's not going to be seen? Uh, what do we have to do? What do the actors have to do? Where are they going to be looking? All that kind of stuff, um, uh, it, you know, really plays into it. And then talking to the actors and, and changing things on the fly, that, that happened a lot too. Um, yeah, it was, it was really interesting. And we're speaking to Stephen on Friday, so I can't wait to get his take on this. And again, again to, to, to be positive about this whole experience, you know, as you said at the beginning, for every little thing that people will see that's wrong, as you as you said, point out the five or six things that people got right. And I think 
while people are looking for things that are wrong, they're overlooking the, all the things that are correct. They're, they're not noticing, as we showed earlier, the photos of all the, you know, the aerial photos on the walls and the, the, the briefing missions and the letter trays and the paperwork there and the cigarette packets and the, and the incredible detail with, with the, the flight gear and the oxygen masks and the heated suits and all that stuff that's going on all the time. Um, so much of it was, was good. And, and of course, little things do creep through. So we're at the point now where the public have seen eight of the nine episodes, one more to go. Um, has it lived up to all your expectations? Yeah, yeah, it really has. I mean, um, sure, there's, there's you know, little things here and there, but um, most of the people aren't going to see that. They're going to see the overall big picture. And more importantly, uh, they're going to understand what these heroes from a greatest generation actually went through. Um, you know, to, it's bringing it to life with more authenticity, detail, realism than anything else. Even all those things combined, there really isn't anything that comes close. Uh, the only thing that do come close were like uh, the films back in the day, the Weiler film, Memphis Bell, which actually shot during their in color or, um, you know, Thunderbolt was another good one or uh, mission for today. It's basically a, a you know, it, it's a documentary done at the time. I mean, those things were shot there at the time and, Frankly, nothing else in my mind has come even close since then. There's some, been some really good shows, but uh, nothing with this kind of level of detail. Um, and and that's what is so impressive to me um, about uh, having been a part of this is is the comments you see online from the family members. Uh, from it's like I had no idea that that Grandpa or my dad went through this kind of stuff, or he never talked about it, um, or when he did talk about it, you know, it, it doesn't convey exactly what this show does convey and that's incredible and, and i am so thankful for all the people that that made this happen um and and brought it to life because it, it could have been you know it, there's a good chance it may not have made it to life because it was such mm -hmm. an expensive production probably one of the most expensive productions done uh, and beautifully done and i'm just thankful to have been a part of it and thankful to everybody uh for the parts that they did to make this thing look as good as it, it did Brilliant. Well, thank we'll do a couple of questions from viewers. And um, one from Gregory is, what is going to happen to all the items and props from the production? So that's going from the big, the fuselages, the gimbals, right down to the details of the of the photos, things like that. So are you aware of what's happening with it all? Yeah, there was uh, discussions about that because early on I was like, oh, my, you know, Thorpe Abbott's a museum there needs one of these B-17s. And, and, um, and on one of my excursions out there, I, I talked to him about that. And, and again, this is just me doing – you know, my weekend thing uh, has nothing to do with what's actually going on in production. But, you know, I, I talked to those guys about, you know, you guys, you know, should should have one of these. And, and they said actually that they were offered one, but they turned it down. They, you know, their museum um, is volunteer. And to have one of these, you know, aircraft, you're going to need it to be in a building. And there's going to be a lot of maintenance needed to, to take care of it. And frankly, that's just too much for them. And, and they also didn't want it to take away from, from what they have. So I completely understood that. But um, the, the B-17s and all the equipment went into storage. And um, there's some pictures of them, you know, coming out on trailers, going into storage. And, and again, that's above my pay grade. I don't know yeah. what Apple's going to decide to do with them. But I'm, I'm sure a lot of that stuff is going to go to good homes. There's every museum in the world or in, in all of the U.K. is asking for them. So I'm sure they're going to find good homes. Um, and, uh, you know, there's just, yeah, it's amazing stuff. All the equipment that they built down to little details. It's just, I, I don't see a lot of that getting thrown away. But, again, it's above my pay grade. So yeah. hopefully it'll, it'll be taken care of. So as an aircraft guy, and you are our aircraft guy this week, we've got a question from Great Dominion saying, uh, why couldn't they have used P-51 B and C models for Tuskegee attack scene? They didn't get any P-51Ds until latest 44, even 45 there were no rockets involved in the real event either. So again, people in the sidebar are joining in saying, but there are certain models available, not available. Do you have any insight into why that decision? Yeah. For every one thing that you don't like, tell me five or six things that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like. Okay. Yeah. Sure. There's, there's some little mistakes here and there. Um, yeah. I, I'm a rocket guy. I love the HVAR five inch rockets. We have them on our harpoon and done a lot of research on those things. And yeah, probably not quite correct for that, but, um, but again, you know, it it, um, it looks really good. And, um, you know, for the flying aircraft, 
Uh, they were probably trying to mimic what they had available to them. And there was a D model that was a flyer. So they probably had to, to mimic that. Yeah, sure. You know, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's kind of tough. Compromises have to be made. And again, how many people in the general public are going to notice that? Um, so, um, yep. Tell me uh, five or 10 positive things. <laughs> no, that's a good, good point. And I think one of the things I want to kind of move on to now is the fact that it's also too e can be too easy to get bogged down in every single detail of authenticity when in fact what you're trying to do is tell a story of people and donald miller raised a very good point in his 25 plus years of writing about the eighth, eighth air force is the question that he can't answer is why these 22 and 23 year olds ever got back into those aircraft a second time after they'd done one mission you know why would any rational human being climb into an aluminum as you would say aluminium tube and fly into uh, occupied europe with all the dangers that come across and i think all of you in that i know have been involved in this you were well aware of what these young men went through and i'm assuming the actors went through it as well i think i was reading somewhere a lot of them are reading eighth air force memoirs on set i'm assuming they all got a bit of the bug when they were there yeah i think a lot of them did and uh Several of them were real interested in learning to fly as well. But, uh, and, and a lot of them got to meet the family members too. I mean, we had several uh, folks come on, on, uh, on set and, uh, and, and meet the, you know, the family of the people that, or, that they were portraying. So, yeah, they, all the actors seemed to have a, a heavy respect for what was going on and uh, opened their eyes too, to, which is what, you know, this whole series is, is going to do. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it, it, it's in, incredible. Um, yeah, all these, uh, you know, the effort, like like right there, there there's uh, Crosby, you know, the actor, uh, learning how to sit at his table and and where things are going to be and how he's going to, um, you know, do the navigation. I think that looks like it's probably a Trondheim mission, but yeah, yeah. he really really wanted to spend extra time, um, really wanting to learn that stuff and did a really good job. And I think that. I said it earlier, that is conveyed on screen. You know, when Crosby is there navigating, you sense that he really is controlling a massive, great formation of bombers. It is his movement of the rulers and the slide rules and the protractors and his his mental arithmetic and everything. You, you sense he's actually doing that. And again, we can all think of those old classic productions where an actor's just kind of vaguely pointing at something on a wall and, and it, it doesn't really seem believable. And I think I, I as a viewer, to visualize that crew of 10 people working together in harmony, all with their various jobs going on. And, you know, and that is something that obviously people like yourself got involved in. And, but again, as a historical advisor and all these other things, you've got, when, when do you know, when do you just have to just shut up and go, yeah, it's, it's too much now. You know, there's, there's all these people there setting up lights and sound and order as actors trying to give performances. Did you learn quickly when to just kind of, shut the fuck up <laughs> oh yeah absolutely at a certain point you know we do the training in in uh dave's cockpit or, or in the in uh the mock-ups and then they go up in and it's just like yeah it's you're 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 sitting back watching the magic happen and and that is yeah that's that's a really amazing part is to watch these guys do their things and sometimes we'd have to you know point out something to do it differently this time um or the director would take you know several takes and keep going and going until he gets it right um, in, you know, it matches the picture that's inside his head. Um, so yeah, there's, um, uh, you go up to a certain point and then, you know, your, your baby leaves the nest, so to speak, and, and they do an amazing job. And it, it that is, it's really, really cool to see. Yeah. And I think everybody who's watching this has, although it took, it was a slow burn and, and Rosie wasn't in the first episode, but I think, Everyone has got to like those characters. I was talking with Don Miller yesterday. Given that there is only really four main characters in that entire nine series production, when you think of how many speaking roles there were in Band of Brothers, where at least so 25 of the guys are there in episode one all the way through to episode 10, um, try to bring down the story of the 8th Air Force that literally tens of thousands of men served in down to a few crews. Um, you obviously were aware of that. I problem problem as well of, of of identities. So you know when you've got things like oxygen masks on, are you are you you're thinking okay they'd always have their masks and their goggles on, but at a certain point again for filmmaking and narrative reasons you've got to have some goggles come off and some masks come off so that you can see who people are. So is that 
you know, you obviously realize that's another compromise. Yeah, it sure is. And uh, sometimes when the guy takes his mask off and he's talking or doing stuff up at altitude and, and uh, yeah, that was, you know, one of the things that was trying to kill the flight crew more than, than the Germans was the atmosphere, you know, yeah. uh, how cold it was and, and, um, and the oxygen, you know, deprivation stuff. And a lot of that is portrayed in, in the, the show that, um, um, you know, and also going back to what you're saying about the crew, you know, the crew's trained as a cohesive unit um, back in the States. And then those guys flew together like crazy and worked together. And so that was one of the reasons why uh, they would get back up in that airplane every single time is because they're not going to leave their buddies behind. And sometimes if a guy was sick, it just drove him crazy that he couldn't be there to do his part with his crew. And, um, and that's, that was one of the, the things that uh, Dale Dye was, was doing in boot camp is, is making these guys come, come together as a cohesive unit. And that's what we were doing too in the cockpit, you know, everybody working together as a cohesive crew. And, and they portrayed that beautifully in, in this, in this series. Um, and then the whole, yeah, the, you know what we call PTSD nowadays, which wasn't, you know, wasn't a thing then, but they were learning about it like crazy, like with everything else on this whole entire bomber campaign. They were learning, you know, going through a steep learning curve, and a lot of guys were dying. A lot of guys were cracking up as a result, being flak happy. So it's nice that they show so many other, you know, personal aspects um, to, to this bombing campaign that, that really drives home. It's like, yeah, why did they, how could they get back in that aircraft again after seeing the horrors that they did? on a near daily basis. And it's a good point because, because you know, I, I haven't had Dale die on my channel for this, but I've heard him on other podcasts saying that he was uncertain at the beginning whether he should get involved in this because air crew is a completely different environment to what he's been doing before, which is chuck out training up the, the foot soldiers, the, 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 the poor bloody infantry. And yet I think one of the things that has been conveyed well by this series is that brotherhood works whether you're in a submarine in an aircraft or in a platoon on the ground and 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 dale is the master of getting these guys to 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 come together and work as one and understand that there's this common objective and we had a question from scott grimwood about um how you know how how were you did you interact with dale die but he what he, he wasn't on set for the whole production was he? he was more of the boot camp is that right no no he was there the whole time okay uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, beforehand and, and probably after too. So yeah, he was there the whole time. Um, initially, I came in working um, w with him, and then we basically just kind of like went in different directions. And so okay. um, I was doing my thing. Um, initially, we were out in the field um, doing stuff at Abingdon and, and uh, mostly at Abingdon, uh, filming out there. And then when the volume started up, you know, coming up and running, then uh, I was back in in the studio, and uh, uh, Dale was out. Uh, out in the field a lot um and then he we he, was, he would come into the volume on occasion too and then he had a bunch of guys working with him as well that were coming in and rotating you know in and out so um you know i had some interaction with him it wasn't a lot i was just kind of doing my own thing um on the you know the the technical i think i think they called me button pushers or something like that i can't remember some, some term like that but working with the actors in in the different departments so we we were kind of like uh sort of like two ships passing in the night but but we did interact. That that's a great but uh, interesting insight there. But um, I have to ask: Was there one particular actor or someone in the crew who had the best Dale Die impression? Because I know a lot of the Band of Brothers actors, and they still talk about who was the best at doing the the, the Captain Die. And I think Michael Kudlitz is up there. Rick Gomez. Was there a particular actor on set or crew member who did the best Dale Die? You can tell us. There's only a few hundred people watching. Yeah, um, I'm probably going to back off of that one. <laughs> so, yeah, but you I, are admitting there were impressions being done. Are you, would you go that far? Oh yeah, there were impressions being done, but not only about him, but you know the guys ribbing each other and and that that you'd see too. You know, a crew, uh, you know, as guys do, kind of putting each other down and playing and playing hard, and so that that was neat to see. But uh, but uh, yeah, I don't I don't think anybody would want to to uh, mess with Captain Die, um, especially in in front of him. <laughs> You might get shot. <laughs> I, I my my personal story of Dale Dye is um he was in attendance when I was giving a presentation at Breckor Manor in Normandy a few years ago, and uh, I've I've uh, done presentations there to to veterans who fought there, and I was a bit nervous. But there was something about having Dale Dye fix me with his steely gaze while I'm doing a presentation about what happened there. 
and he didn't interrupt me once. But afterwards, he came up and said, that was very good, Woody, but you made one little mistake. You said injured when you meant wounded. And I went, oh, yeah, I did do that. I should have said wounded. He said, but other than that, it was all right. But honestly, when he fixes you with his gaze, you, you, you kind of, Nothing else in the world exists, and uh, that's why he's so good at doing what he does because he, he brings that he brings that experience. But also, people want to please him. He people people have this desire to get it right because he's he sets such high standards. And it must have been great for everybody having someone like Dale Die on board. And that's where the influence of Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks and everybody else involved in this that, as Donald Miller was saying, was filtering down. And you said it yourself at the beginning that. The intention is to get it right. And I think you must have been aware of that every single day on set. Yeah, absolutely. And I remember after Band of Brothers, Tom Hanks uh, telling a story about how they had portrayed um, one of the characters in, in, in a, a fashion that wasn't correct with, with history. And, and it bothered the family. And in turn, that bothered him greatly. And uh, I, I, I remember those words and that kind of... Uh, went with me through this stuff too when and there were certain certain things where um you know uh the idea is to, to make this entertaining and sometimes you know a, a lot of frankly what i tried to do is was not let some of the hollywood classic hollywood mistakes into this production and yeah. so uh steven rosenbaum talked about that on on a on a podcast um where uh you know i came to him came to them early on saying, hey, you know, engine fires. Yeah, they're going to happen, but please, no fire coming out of the front of the engine. It just just didn't happen, you know, for various reasons. And I, I even put an email together, and, and it had lots of period photos, you know, where the flames would start on the engine and come back or in the wing, that kind of stuff. And um, he said that, you know, of course, there's entertainment you know, values, and, and so th there are certain liberties that we had to take. And, of course, I'm, he said, I'm, I'm sure Ty is throwing stuff at the screen when he's watching this, but... <laughs> which really cracked me up because um, that stuff happened definitely. Uh, but it, it is, it is entertainment. No, definitely. And I think that, you know, that was one of the criticisms I saw a few, a few oh, days ago. I think, you are, you are sorry. One of the criticisms I saw after episode one or two or three or something was that there were too many fireballs. Um, but then again, you're watching it on a screen. You're trying to keep, keep track of all these dozens, hundreds of aircraft. And I, I guess, they had to make it visual. But to, to kind of wrap things up, any other particular favorite story from the set or particular things that you're particularly proud of that you, you haven't shared yet that you'd like to? Oh, oh, now I got you back. Okay. Did you get that last question? No, I, I don't think I did. Oh, the fireballs okay. are about two or yeah, three. Yeah, just we could ask you any other particular things, any memories from the set or things that you were particularly proud of or, or, or things that you haven't said yet that you think that the viewers will be interested in? Yeah, there's lots of stuff. I mean, um, um, I was proud of the Greenland landing. That was really good. Uh, Crosby on Regensburg, where he's going back to his table after shooting and then has to wipe the shells off the top of the table. Um, the little detail stuff in the background. Um yeah, and then seeing how the guys did in the cockpit, uh, we had a lot of kind of mechanical issues with some of the, the cockpits um, um, where the control wheels weren't necessarily working together. It might have been a little bit sloppy by comparison. Uh, so hopefully, you know, I've seen some of that stuff, but a lot of it hasn't, you know, hasn't made this, the screen. Or some stuff was kind of blurry that, you know, really was a concern. Um, but, uh, yeah, there's so many things I'm proud of and proud of the series altogether it's just it, it really is you know magic and world war ii history aviation history brought to life for people to see so yeah i, I couldn't be more proud well i think that's where i want to end it with you is that for the for the fact there are these little faults is that the world has been given a masterful recreation of air combat and you know the 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 senses are are all firing. As I said to you earlier, I find myself just kind of going fuck during some of those scenes when there's you know aircraft disappearing at the skies and wings falling off and machine gun fire and the rockets and the enemy aircraft and no series has come close to, to or t or film to to recreating that. And I think uh, I'll be accused of being being simpering and uh, and and but I you know I I'm a I'm a positive person and I think it's been a remarkable achievement and I want to thank you for being with us and thank you for your part of this of this incredible TV show. Yeah, thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. It's nice to 
to try and shed some light on all the people and all the effort that went in behind the scenes to make this work. And, and I'm so thankful for all the work that they did do. And I'm also extremely thankful um, to have been a part of it too. So uh, thank you, Michael Foley. Thank you, um, uh, Stephen. Thank you all you guys that brought me in. I really appreciate it. Well, brilliant. It's been great talking to you, Ty. And reminder, folks, we've got John Orloff with us tomorrow, Hattie Hearn with us on Thursday, and Stephen Rosenbaum is with us on Friday. And then at some point in a couple of weeks' time, I'm going to do a kind of free-for-all call-in where anybody who worked on the show, be it extras or vehicles or, or ad, uh, anyone, can kind of call in and share a few of their experience. I'm going to set that one up. So we haven't finished with dealing with people from the set, but basically we went with Ty first because you were there all the time on all, your, all the important stuff. So, folks, you know what to do. Hit like, hit subscribe. Check out Ty's website uh, in the description below, and I will see you all again tomorrow. This is Paul Woodhouse for World War II TV saying enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers, everybody. Bye.